All right, thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'm just gonna give it a minute or two for folks to file in here and then uh, I'll do a quick intro and get started. All right, I'm just gonna wait just another moment for uh, everyone to hop on here and then uh, we'll get rolling. Thanks everyone for joining tonight. All right, Kara, are you ready to get started? I am. All right, I'll do a quick introduction. Um, again, thanks everyone for joining tonight. Um, really enjoyed doing these parent education um, seminars and webinars uh, this fall. So thanks for finding some time on this evening on a uh, day after an election day uh, to join us to, to talk about nutrition and, and hear from Kara. Um, we had a really great presentation from Kara as well as Cheryl and, and Dr. Devin a few weeks ago on the um, female athlete um, discussion. And I'm definitely looking forward to her presentation tonight, specifically on nutrition um, and sports nutrition for our athletes. Uh, great information in the upcoming presentation for parents as well as athletes. And we'll be recording this uh, for everyone to view afterwards as well. Um, just a quick introduction for Kara, I'll just read as well. Um, Kara's lived in Steamboat for 24 years and studied at Colorado State University and Central Michigan University, as well as a year-long medical internship at the Mayo Clinic School of Health Sciences. Currently, Kara is a multi-year program studying functional medicine and has deep love for sports nutrition, having worked with many athletes from recreational athletes to Olympians. As an athlete herself, Kara was a coach for SSWSC for 10 years. Thank you. Uh, 10 years ago with her husband, Dave, and is proud that her almost nine-year-old son, Max, is now SSWC athlete himself. Kara is an avid skier, an ultra runner, and has competed in many events of marathon to 100-mile length, noting that nutrition plays a key role in every one of them. Um, so thank you, Kara, for joining, uh, finding the time to speak to our parents. And um, I'll control the slides here this evening uh, and let Kara focus on her presentation. Um, in terms of question and answer, uh, folks can put questions in the chat. We can get to those at the end. And uh, we like to open up for some Q&A. So if anyone would like to just, just uh, ask a question directly, just raise your hand and I can unmute you and you can speak directly to Kara as well. So with that, Kara, I'll pull up your slides and we can get started. All right, thank you. Thank you for having me again. This is fun to do these. All right. All right. Okay, I'm gonna move this over so I can see the screen. Okay. All right, so I was talking to Dave about this before we started. Um, it's always so interesting doing presentations for large groups on a um, broad subject like this, because some of you may have kids or the 
kids are in the um, talk right now that are high level athletes who know a lot about sports nutrition as well. And some people might just be starting off. So I really think that the things that we'll talk about tonight, everyone can use these. And for some people, some may be, um, a lot of things may be new information and a lot of it may be review and other things um, you can build upon all of that. Okay, so the principles of what you want to think about when you're thinking about sports nutrition is, and these are things that we'll go over in this presentation. Do you have a good nutrition base? So you don't wanna have your nutrition dialed in only for training and competition. It needs to be what you're doing every day. We wanna talk about pre-exercise nutrition, what you're going to eat during and what you eat afterwards, hydration, weather elements, other things that might affect um, what you need to eat and sports specific training. So something that I said in a winter sports club um, presentation that I gave, I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago was I told a group of kids what you are not doing as far as your nutrition, because nutrition is a big part of training, your competitors are doing. And after that presentation, I went to natural grocers and there were two athletes in there who were there buying items that I had talked about in the presentation. And they said that line was the thing that made them buy into it and that they were really interested in getting their nutrition dialed in. So think about for, you know, I've had conversations with some of the coaches before in the Nordic program and other things. And they said, how do we get the kids to buy in to eating well when maybe they go to a World Cup and the athletes are drinking Red Bull and not eating anything and taking in excessive amounts of caffeine? Well, you have to remember one in a million athletes are going to continue to perform well with that type of a junk food diet. And everyone else needs to really work on their nutrition. So that's a fluke when that happens and continues to. So questions to ask yourself on a daily basis, um, on a training day, on a rest day, on a competition day, is your diet high in quality and variety? Are you getting a variety of different macronutrients, the carbohydrates, the proteins, the fats, are those all in each meal? Are you exercising while you're fueled? So for a lot of you that are in school, you wanna think about depending if you get out, if you have a skier schedule and you get out early, or if you're in all day and you're going to practice at four o'clock after school, make sure that you're leaving enough time to go to practice fueled. You can't go to a practice at four o'clock when you ate lunch at 11 o'clock and call it good. And also just making sure that the diet is varied in that you have a lot of um, vitamins, minerals, all of the things that you need. So needs of the young athlete. I have a couple slides in here that are similar to a couple of things I shared in the female athlete triad and Red's presentation. I don't know how much crossover there is, but just know that there is not a one size fits all for any young athlete. Um, your nutrition needs to be commensurate with your training load. And I would imagine in 30 people that are on this um, call, and I don't know how many kids are in each of those families, we're going to have people that are freestyle skiers, Nordic skiers, Alpine skiers. You all have different needs. There's different training levels. So you can dive deeper into all of that. But all athletes should start fueling when they first get up in the morning with a good breakfast. Um, you should make sure that there is a breakfast, there is a lunch, and there is a dinner with snacks in there in and around training. And just know that your athletic performance is going to be tied to you eating well and developing an ideal plan of what works for you because not all foods work for everything, everybody and that you have enough quality and quantity of everything and the timing of your food. So when you're eating afterwards, when you're eating before, what you're eating during and the timing all of, the, all of that really would matter. And all of your meals, and I'll say it over and over again, should have a good carbohydrate source, should have a protein source and should have some fat source. And all of that will work best when it's together. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail.
So a solid nutrition base. You want to have an optimal diet, as I said, every day, not just on race day. You want to eat a diet that is nutrient dense. So skip filling yourself up on candy. People probably have a lot of candy right now. It was just Halloween, but you don't want to fill yourself up on Doritos and soda and things that don't have the nutrients that your body can really use for your performance and for your performance at school as well. You don't want to fill up on that stuff and not have room for all of the good stuff. Um, you want to hydrate throughout the day. So our hydration is best when we do it throughout the day. Not, oh, it's nighttime. I need to drink this whole thing because I haven't drank enough during the day. You want to make sure that you're just hydrating throughout the day and regulating your blood glucose. I'll talk about that a little bit more. When you have a steady stream of carbohydrates, not extreme highs and extreme lows, you perform better. So we want waves of when our blood sugar is going up and down. We don't want these big spikes. So an optimal breakfast for every day. It'll look a little bit different for everybody, but what might be okay, but not terrible. Let's say you had eight ounces of juice or 16 ounces of juice and you had some oatmeal. That's gonna give you some nutrients, but it's probably not gonna stick with you. It doesn't have everything that we're looking for. It is all carbohydrates. If you had a cup of oatmeal, you had some berries, maybe you put hemp parts or flax seeds in there and some walnuts and you had water with that, and then with or without maybe some eggs on the side for extra protein, then you're getting everything. You have carbohydrates, you have good healthy fats, you have um, protein in there. And we want something that's going to stick with you. Most of you go to school pretty early in the morning. We want something that's gonna stay with you for several hours. So water, I'm gonna talk a lot about hydration. I think it is very interesting. I know a lot of you, depending on what program you're in, your training load during the summertime is really high, especially some of the higher level Nordic athletes. And I know that because I've worked with a lot of you. So your dry land training and your training during the summers are, are a lot. And I feel like in general, as athletes, we're pretty good about our water intake during the summer and we're pretty poor about it during the winter. We don't feel that there, we're sweating as much. It's not as hot. We're not thinking about electrolyte replacement, but we do need all of those things. So I'm gonna keep pounding you on the hydration. So the function of water and why we need to hydrate carries nutrients in and out of the cells. So those electrolytes that we need and we take maybe with some sports products, we need water to bring that in and out of the cells. It aids in digestion. If we are severely um, dehydrated, we can have gastrointestinal issues. Maybe our stomach doesn't feel too good. Um, it's also water makes up part of muscle. So we need to have those muscles hydrated to perform. We also need um, water in there to help us repair those muscles and also cools us during respiration for better performance. We have free water from water, from drinks, things like that. You can also get water from fruits and vegetables. So the effects of dehydration, when we are dehydrated, our sweat races rate is increased. If you are ever wondering if you, it sounds kind of weird, but if you're ever wondering if you have been sweating a lot and losing a lot of sodium and a lot of electrolytes, and it's not a situation where you feel wet and that you have been sweating a lot, just take your hand, your side of your arm and lick it. If it feels salty, you're probably getting dehydrated and you need to replace some of your electrolytes as well. When our sweat rate increases, our blood volume goes up and our heart rate goes up. We don't want our heart rate artificially going up, right? Our core body starts to be increased and our cardiovascular function is decreased, which we don't want. We have less oxygen going um, to our muscles, so they're not performing quite as well. And we start relying on that anaerobic system. We also have a slow removal of waste. Water helps flush everything out of our body. And so we can get um, a loss of electrolytes, but also a buildup of waste products that can really cause cramping and fatigue and things like that. So dehydration, decrease in muscle strength, decrease in speed, decrease in stamina, in energy, in cognition. So especially if we're doing something longer, and I know some of you in the summertime do longer trainings, 
we really need our head right in the game. And so even if you're in a shorter race, your mental, your sports performance is also tied to your mental performance. And so when we talk about, um, you know, the mental side of sports, you need to have your nutrition there so that you are thinking well and you know what you're doing. Uh, it also increases, um, increases the risk of energy. And 95% of all muscle cramps, which most people have gotten at some point, they're all due to dehydration. So sports drinks, they are not all created equally, right? Um, a good natural sports drink is actually coconut water. And if it's summertime, maybe even adding a little bit of sea salt in there as well. Coconut water is filled with potassium. It has a lot of potassium in it, so it's good for replacing that. And it also has carbohydrates in there. So coconut water on its own is actually a good sports drink. Then we have things like Tailwind and Scratch and some of those items. I like both of those. They're both Colorado companies. And if you look at the ingredients, I mean, Scratch is cane sugar, pure cane sugar. Most of these actually are uh, organic ingredients. Lemon juice, lime, magnesium, potassium, calcium, citrate, vitamin C. Same thing with Tailwind, which has actually a little bit more sodium in it. Those are great drinks for you to have on the fly. But then a lot of young athletes will go for Red Bull and Rockstar and things like that. And I want to stress that a lot of those products have a very high amount of milligrams of caffeine, which is not good for young people or really anybody to have that much. And if you look at the ingredients, there is a lot of preservatives, chemicals, things like that. And you don't want that. You're definitely gonna probably get jittery. Um, you can get dehydrated faster. And all of these ingredients may cause stomach distress. So I put this in here. This is definitely something I like to do in the summer. You can um, save it for then. But this is one of my favorite juices to make in the summer. This is never a meal replacement. It's something that you would have maybe just throughout the day in the summertime when there's a lot of fresh vegetables around or you would have it with your meals. It's um, watermelon, cucumber, celery, mint, ginger. Um, you could add some other things as well as you want. I usually add a little bit of sea salt. You get tons of sodium and potassium. Actually, celery has a lot of sodium in it. And it's just really, really refreshing. So try this out if you have a juicer um, next summer. So carbohydrates. So we want to talk about carbohydrates. And again, some people, this is a review of what the carbohydrates are. And some people, um, they need to know this. So carbohydrates are the most easily accessed um, energy source in the body when it's stored as a glycogen. So consumed Carbohydrates continue to replenish all of the supplies that we're using. And we use carbohydrates in everything. If we're vacuuming, if we're studying, if we're walking the dog, if we're training, we're using carbohydrates. And our bodies have an unlimited ability to store fat. Our protein is mostly in our muscles. And then we also have um, a limited amount of carbohydrates that we can store. People say that's 900 to 2000, depending on the person, to be stored and ready to use for energy. That's why you have to continually replace it. Um, carbohydrates, for the most part, are the food sources that have fiber. And we need fiber to keep our gastrointestinal systems working. We need fiber to feed the good bacteria in our guts. We need fiber for um, a feeling of fullness. We need it for lowering cholesterol and things like that, that most of you don't have to worry about now. Um, good sources of carbohydrates, grains like quinoa and farro and whole wheat, brown rice, amaranth, corn, millet, things like that. Fruit, dairy products are a carbohydrate. People don't think about that. Cheese is not really a carbohydrate, but milk and yogurt is a carbohydrate. It has natural sugars in it. They're just not sweet, so we don't think about it. Um, vegetables are also sources of carbohydrates. Now, if you think about a potato or peas or corn, which are our starchy carbohydrates, they will have more carbohydrates in them, of course, than a cucumber or asparagus or something like that. And then we have our beans and lentils. Those are also. So carbohydrates. Our muscles are like a sponge. I had a muscle 
I wanted to show you guys, but um, a muscle is like a sponge and it can suck certain things up. So carbohydrates keep the muscles full of fuel. When we eat something, let's say this is a banana sitting here. The banana is a carbohydrate. When we start to consume that banana, it starts turning into blood glucose in our mouths. It starts circulating through our blood. And what we want to do is we want to get that um, blood glucose into our muscles. Um, we have insulin that is secreted from our pancreas, from the beta cells in our pancreas, and that acts as a little key. So think about the insulin coming through our body. So if everything's working correctly and somebody doesn't have diabetes, then we need some help with that. But the insulin comes around. It's a key that opens our muscles that works in the body just naturally. And the blood glucose floods in there so that we can have it stored in there to be used for exercise. And glycogen is our, the, bot, the human body's primary energy source that it wants to use. So carbohydrate needs for an athlete. So the carbohydrate needs for an athlete will vary wildly. Your age, your activity level, how many hours you train and what sport you're training for. So this is a general thing that I'm showing you right now, but intakes can vary from three to 10 grams per kilogram, depending on the athlete. I think I talked about this last time to find out what, um, kilo, how, how much you weigh in kilograms. You just take your weight in pounds and you divide it by 2.2 and then that'll give you the amount. So if we're talking about an athlete that weighs 130 pounds, let's say 59 kilograms. If they were somebody who needed five grams per kilogram, which is about middle of the road for an athlete for most of you in your age, that's 295 grams of carbohydrate a day or 1,180 calories just in carbohydrates. We're not talking about yet about fiber and fat. So you can get much more specific on exactly how many carbs you need during and before and afterwards, but this gives you just kind of a good idea for a general athlete, high school age athlete, how much you might need in a day. So what does that look like? I will tell you a carbohydrate serving is 15 grams. So if you picked up a yogurt and it said 11 grams, 12, 18, 15, that's about a serving of a carbohydrate. If you picked up a yogurt and it said that there was 60 grams in this little container, you know it has a lot of added sugar to it. So um, about 300 grams of carbohydrate might look like a cup of oatmeal, half a cup of berries. Those are both carbohydrates, a banana, flax, nuts, six ounce yogurt, and maybe some green tea with honey. Um, a large tortilla wrap, one third of a cup of hummus, veggies, turkey, and an apple. Those little numbers I put next to there are how many servings of carbohydrate those would be. Um, for dinner, maybe a medium sweet potato, five ounces of salmon, and one and a half cups of sauteed greens. So it might not be as much as it sounds. So sometimes those numbers seem like a lot, but I bet a lot of you are actually eating as much. So carbohydrates, we have complex carbohydrates and then we have simple carbohydrates. And the complex carbohydrates are the ones that you want to, uh, you want that to comprise most of your diet. Oatmeal, quinoa, whole grains, beans and lentils and different um, soy, uh, potatoes and whole form, all of those things have a lot of fiber. They take longer to digest. So if you're eating those things, if you had oatmeal in the morning or you had some hot quinoa or something like that, because of the fiber content, it's going to take a while to hit your body. And that's actually what we want. But we do need simple carbohydrates for fast digestion and, and quick energy when we're exercising, right? So um, if we need something, if anyone has ever seen in a physical therapy office or a doctor's office, they'll often keep little juice boxes. So if they are maybe working out with somebody or they have somebody on a treadmill and the person's blood sugar goes down really, really low, they can give them a juice to get that up quickly. So some simple carbohydrates for really fast energy when you're feeling like you need it. Um, fruit would be a good um, source of that. Sports drinks, gels and other sports, you know, your honey stinger chews, things like that, and straight honey and sugars. So protein, why do we need it? You hear protein all the time. Proteins provide amino acids. 
they are what help us aid in muscle repair. So when you are exercising, you're creating little micro tears in your muscles. When you eat enough protein to repair that, you can start building muscle. Um, they are an essential point, uh, part of enzymes, hormones, and antibodies. If we don't have enough um, protein in our diet, we can often um, get sick easier. Maybe we're catching colds, things like that. We certainly will not recover from exercise. Um, it's also needed in hemoglobin formation to carry oxygen to the muscles. So we also need that to keep our iron stores up. And and it's important for branch chain amino acids, which you probably hear a lot about for recovery. Good sources, things like eggs, nuts and seeds, legumes such as beans and soy and uh, lentils, meat, poultry, fish and cheese. So protein needs for the athlete. If I was looking at somebody who was not an athlete, just somebody walking around on the streets, they might need, again, let's take our 59 kilogram athlete, they might need 0.8 grams per kilogram a day. So that is not going to be too high. And I'll tell you that in general, non-athletes aside, most people in the United States outside of athletes and the elderly get plenty of protein and often sometimes too much. So for athletes though, our needs range from 1.2 to 1.8. So do we have an athlete who is maybe doing more endurance, more uphill training, or do we have maybe some of the um, alpine athletes who are doing a lot of strength training and trying to really, really build those muscles for strength, their needs might be higher. Maybe they need 1.5, 1.6 grams per kilogram or even higher. So if you are, let's say that we're talking about a 1.4 gram per kilogram athlete, somebody who is doing some strength training, maybe running one to two hours a day to meet needs, that's about 82 grams of protein a day. Um, if you eat meat, that's pretty easy to achieve. I'll give you some um, examples in a minute. But if the athlete is a vegetarian, it might be a little bit trickier, but certainly can be met. So here are some protein servings. Three and a half ounces of chicken. A good rule of thumb is the palm of a woman's hand is about three ounces. Not a giant man, man's hand, but three ounces at about, about the palm of a woman's hand. And for most of you, you're probably gonna need five, six ounces at a meal. But <clears throat> to show you, you can add that up pretty quickly. Three and a half ounces of chicken, 30 grams. Three and a half ounces of salmon, 22 grams. A four ounce hamburger, 28 grams. Six ounces or a can of really good quality tuna might be 40 grams. So you can see you can get to that 82 pretty quickly. But if you're not eating meat, you'll need to add it up and maybe add in a shake or something with, a, um, with some protein powder. So fat, we need it. We shouldn't be afraid of it. We just need the right kinds of fats. So fat provides essential <clears throat> fatty acids that we need. Anything essential is something that we must take in through our food. Um, it's really important for the fat soluble vitamins that are vitamin A, D, E, and K. They are transported through our body to where they need to get to via fat. <clears throat> fat adds flavor. We know it tastes good. It's a fuel source for sure. When we are kind of blazing through our carbohydrate stores, we will then go to our fat stores and that's how it should work. Um, it's a fuel source, like I said part of cell structure. So all of our cell structures have a lipid membrane. It's really important. And then fat also insulates and protects our organs. Um, source of good sources are nuts and seeds, avocado, flax, olive oil, fatty fish, like sardines and anchovies and <clears throat> salmon and tuna, and then coconut and avocado and things like that. So there's really no exact amount of fat that we need, but I would say if you're Diet is about 30% fat. That doesn't mean it can only be 30%, but it should be at least 30%. Um, you want to make sure that you're getting a lot of the monounsaturated fats, a lot of the nuts and seeds and salmon and things like that. Those are really, really good for recovery. They have a lot of the omega-3s. And most athletes really that I work with need to kind of increase their beneficial fats a little bit. So I shared this in the last talk. 
This gives you a little bit of an idea of overall calorie needs, sports specific. So here we have 120 pound athlete and 160 pound athlete. So if we're talking about somebody with a moderate training load, that's one to one and a half hours a day, five to six days a week and at, at a pretty decent intensity, you might need somewhere between 2,200 and 2,500 um, calories a day. Then we go to that 160 pound athlete and you see they need upwards of 3000 calories. So a lot of you will fall into that high training load or the very high training load. Just wanted to really put this in here to show you how much you actually need, okay? And that is also compounded by the fact that you're young, you all are still growing and you don't want to disrupt that. You need to make sure that you're fueling your body and then the exercise is on top of it. So vitamins, vitamins enhance energy production. They're important for our tissue repair when we're trying to repair those muscles really important for red blood cell formation and antioxidants. So endurance exercise and training really hard is oxidative and it could have a negative effect on our body in the long run. We know that the benefits far outweigh. All we have to do is fight those free radicals. That would be a whole different conversation just on that by eating the antioxidants, which are in our berries and are all of those brightly colored fruits and vegetables. Um, good sources of vitamins are fruits and vegetables and non-processed whole foods, nuts, seeds, lean proteins. And then we get our B vitamins and our vitamin D and C and A and all of those things. Minerals. Minerals are something that when they're low, they cause us a lot of problems when we're exercising because we lose them through our sweat. So uh, minerals are uh, important for energy production. They're also important. I don't think I put this down here, but for stress reduction, some things like that, like magnesium, uh, body tissue repair, muscle contraction, oxygen transport, maintaining a balance, acid-base balance in our body. Um, again, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, magnesium, things like that. And so sometimes we will replace those with, we need those from whole food sources, but sometimes we will replace those through noons and different sports drinks and things like that. So pre-exercise, the name of the game is that we want to top off those glycogen stores that I said were in our muscles. So if you are going to a training in the morning that's gonna be a couple hours long and you ate dinner last night at eight o'clock and then you went to bed and you didn't eat the whole night, right? Because you're sleeping, we're in a fasted state. If you wake up in the morning and you don't, go to, don't eat before you go to training, you're gonna be low because your body's been using those carbohydrate stores, right? Overnight, just to keep your body going. So you wanna top those off with your breakfast. So, or at any other time of the day. So you wanna have an adequate meal that has enough carbohydrates in there to fuel yourself. You want to include a little bit of protein in there, which will help with recovery and also reduce that post-muscle soreness that I'll talk about in a little while. And choose a meal that's a little bit, um, lower in fat and lower in fiber, just to decrease stomach discomfort. You wouldn't want to eat, let's say, a giant bowl of a couple cups of beans, right? Before you were going running. You wouldn't probably also wanna eat a big plate of bacon before you were going running. Probably isn't gonna make your stomach feel too good. So some examples, oatmeal, berries, crushed nuts, um, maybe with some green tea and honey. Um, whole wheat English muffin, maybe put some eggs on there, some scrambled or over easy or something. Top it with avocado, tomato slices, maybe some spinach and banana. All of those are good, um, good things that are gonna give you enough energy and keep you going. And of course, every single person is gonna be a little bit different on what they can do right before a run. I have been at races before myself where people are downing coffee and eating all sorts of crazy things right before the race and other people have really sensitive stomachs. So it's, um, there is a little bit of individuality there on what will work. So you want to, if, if we're talking about a race or we're talking about maybe like a big training day, you wanna eat breakfast two to four hours before that event. Now, sometimes some of you have races at crazy times during the day and then the, that needs to be also worked out. But if it's something in the morning, that's 
kind of that. You could eat two hours before, then maybe 30 minutes or 45 minutes top off with just a little bit of extra. You want to focus on a balanced meal with combination of complex carbs and simple carbs. And also, if you eat two to four hours before your event, and I'd say more closer to two hours, it also gives you time to go to the bathroom as well before your event. You want to have a little bit of protein, as I said, to decrease um, muscle soreness. And depending on the event, maybe try to get as an average four to 600 calories in your breakfast. So meals for different types of events, it's gonna make a difference. So if we're doing a sprint or a time trial or something like that, or you, um, you're doing something really quick and fast, you want something easy to digest, right? So maybe just some plain quick oatmeal or a smoothie with maybe almond milk, berries, banana, yogurt, uh, teaspoon of peanut butter or almond butter or something like that. If you're doing something longer, you're doing a long training day, a long training ride, you have a long race, um, some of your trainings in the summer, for sure. You want some of those slower digesting carbohydrates for a long day. Maybe you do tortilla breakfast wrap with scrambled eggs, avocado, salsa, sweet potatoes, things like that. So carbohydrate loading before an event. So is it good or is it bad? Well, it's both. So what I would say is you don't want to go into an event or a weekend <clears throat> where you're training where you've been kind of starving yourself of enough carbohydrates throughout the week that, and then think that the night before you're going to overload yourself. It doesn't really work that well. The best way to carb load would be to every day before a big event or something that you need to really perform at, maybe add a half cup or a cup of quinoa or more sweet potato or something, a serving or so, every single day for four to five days before the event. You also just want to make sure that you always keep a steady supply, not too much, not too little. If you don't eat enough and then you eat a lot the night before, you might not sleep well, you might be sluggish, your stomach might be a little bit upset. So during exercise, now there are a million and one sports products. We have Goo and Honey Stinger and Scratch and Tailwind and all of these things. They all use different types of sugars and because of that, they're not all gonna work for everybody. We all have different gastrointestinal systems and some of, the, um, some of those items are gonna work really, really well for people and some won't. Through all of the sports activities I've done over the years, I have tried everything and I always tell everybody, never, ever, ever try anything new, race week or race day, never. And if you go to an event and they have products there, if you know what that's gonna be beforehand, try it out beforehand so you know you can use that, but never just try something that you haven't done before. Experiment with everything before. So you wanna look for things that are gonna give you a quick shot of energy during your exercise. Um, you might wanna add a little bit of protein or fat if you're doing something that's gonna be really long, but for most of the things you all are doing, you want to um, just make sure that you have those easy to digest like my little picture there with the chews and things like that on you to get a quick shot of energy. So it's very dependent on how much you weigh, but as a rule of thumb, let's say 30 to 50 grams of carbohydrate every 45 minutes to an hour after um, the first hour. So if you're doing something that's only an hour long, probably can get away with just having water. But if you're doing something that's going to be a little bit longer than an hour, two hours, three hours, if you're doing long training, then you need to make sure that you're eating this amount, depending on your weight, every 45 minutes to an hour. When I'm in a race, when I'm doing training, I look and I'm like 45 minutes, I've got to get a gel in or something like that. And I just think, okay, hour and a half, 215. Like I think about that all the time and it works well. So you just, again, you have to figure out what works for you, but that's why we have goos and gels and things like that. As um, an example, I believe a, a packet of honey stinger is about 36 grams of carbohydrate um, in one packet. So that falls in line with that. Um, your average gel is going to be more in line of 20 to 28 grams, so a little bit less. Um, and then, you, you know, if you're a, a big person, you might might need more than that an hour. 
So post-exercise, really, really important. Within half of an hour, so within a very important window of 30 minutes after your training, you need to make sure that you are getting 20 to 30 grams of protein in. Now, that could be that you have a smoothie waiting in your car and on the way, if you drive, and on the way home from training or when your mom's picking you up, you drink that. There is a critical window that we need to get a little bit of carbohydrate to replace those glycogen stores. Doesn't have to be your full meal. And if you eat your full meal within a half hour, that's great as well. But if you're not going to eat for an hour, hour and a half, 30 minutes, make sure that you're getting 20 to 30 grams of protein. Um, that could be a lot of different things. I'll give you some examples in a minute, but within an hour and a half of training or an event, make sure you get to your dinner, your breakfast, your lunch, whatever it is. So delayed onset muscle soreness. If anyone has ever experienced this, I bet everybody has. I have that little cartoon that there that says, I'm not sure if it's a delayed muscle soreness or if I'm actually dying. So if anyone has ever not been doing strength training and then started again and you get where you the next day and it gets worse and worse as the day goes goes on that's probably because you jumped into training and it wasn't progressive training where you're slowly building maybe you said oh you know what i used to run five miles at a time i haven't ran in a really long time i'm just going to jump in and run five miles so Delayed onset muscle soreness probably is not as common in young people, but it can definitely happen. And it has to do with you not having enough protein and carbohydrate after your exercise. So some of that glycogen that we talked about can leak out of the damaged cells. You know, we damage cells when we're exercising and it creates the delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, it's not gonna be worse the first day after, it might be the day after that. And that's when you know you have DOMS if it's worse the day after that. And you might be edema, so your muscles feel like really puffy and stiffness and things like that. It can last, I mean, days and days and days, even you know, up to a week to 10 days. Um, and it's just a little micro trauma and tears to the muscle. I just wanna really um, stress how important it is to fuel afterwards. So post-exercise. Before that large meal, what can I eat? What would be um, quick? So a smoothie, maybe you have something with some protein powder. You want something that has at least 15 to 20 grams in it, berries, nut butter, flaxseed, spinach, banana, and some sort of milk to hold it together. It's cold in steamboat. And if you're not using cow dairy milk and you're using coconut or almond or something, you'd have to really worry about it going bad. You could have a smoothie in your car. Maybe you even have a little, um, a little cooler in there, but you can have a smoothie in your car or have your mom bring it to you or something like that so that you're drinking that on the way home from practice. Even some of those little bottles of Orgain or any of those brands, I don't know if you've ever seen those, but those are good to have on hand. They don't need to be refrigerated before they're opened. You just want to get that protein in. Um, something like nuts and an apple with some beef drink. You could have that on hand pretty easily. Um, a lot of protein bars will have 10 to 15 grams of protein in there, or you could have a PB&J wrap. So all of those things that you could have on hand in your backpack or something that don't really need to be refrigerated. So post-exercise meal, you want to get to that again, one hour to one and a half hours after your big training. You could do something like a vegetarian bowl where you have one and a half cups of quinoa or brown rice. There's your carbohydrates, some black beans, more carbohydrates, but also protein. Maybe you have um, so tofu in there, you have veggies, you have avocado, pumpkin seeds, flax seeds, things like that. That would be a great, I love the idea of bowls where we just throw everything together. Um, you could also do a big whole wheat tortilla wrap. Maybe you have chicken in there or tofu or roast beef or something, you have hummus, you have vegetables, avocado, those things would be great post-exercise. So hydration revisited. I'm going to keep talking about that. Um, best to continually hydrate throughout the day. Our body absorbs it best as we're just continually drinking. Now you don't want to drink so much that you're washing your electrolytes out, but you want to have enough. So think about 20 to 24 ounces, two hours before your event. 
that usually also will give you enough time to go to the bathroom before. Five to 10 ounces of fluid every 20 minutes for endurance. So that sounds like a lot, and maybe you can even stretch that out to 30 minutes or 40, depending on the climate of what you're in. But a quick sip like this, small sip, that's about an ounce. So it would be pretty easy for me to quickly drink three ounces of water. And if you have a little handheld water bottle or something, or you're drinking out of a Camelback, even easier. Water, again, is adequate for any exercise up to an hour, probably all you need. <clears throat> if you're doing something an hour, hour and a half longer than that, then add in some electrolytes. Um, if you did a long training and it was summertime and it was hot, to give you an idea of how much you might need to replace for water, you could weigh yourself before the training and after the training. Let's say that your weight is down after the training two pounds or three pounds. Well, you have not actually lost two or three pounds. Um, that is severe water loss. So you wanna have 20 ounces at least for every single pound lost. So three pounds lost, that would be an extra 60 ounces. I've worked with hockey players that with all of that gear, they're sometimes 10 pounds down after a game. So an ounce, like I said, is about a sip. And again, salt tabs, things like that for endurance are important. So signs of dehydration, your urine is dark, right? You want very, very light, light, light lemonade color. Um, a small volume of urine. So if you just really don't have much, your heart rate is really, really high. You know, in the summertime, you go for a run, you're, you're breathing, you're heavy and your heart is racing. If you have a headache, if you have a dull headache throughout the day, it's probably that you're dehydrated. And, you know, drink before you're thirsty. If you're really, really thirsty, typically means that you're already dehydrated. So serious effects of dehydration. Um, if we're talking about somebody who weighs 150 pounds, they had a 1% loss of um, one, one and a half pounds is a 1% loss of water during exercise, their body temperature might go up. 3% or four and a half pounds down, their performance is really impaired. Um, seven and a half pounds down is GI problems and possible heat exhaustion. 10 and a half pounds, you could start hallucinating. And again, there's that cognition and we need that to be really um, on point. You need to be making sure that you're making good decisions. And then if you had a 10% loss of body weight in water, you could be seriously um, affected. You could actually die from that. So we just wanna make sure that we're hydrating enough properly. So weather, we train when it's cold here, right? And it's also hot and it's also very, very dry here and sunny. So weather conditions alter needs. Um, humidity, we don't have humidity, but if you go to train somewhere else where it's humid or you're doing a race where it's humid, you need to understand that you need to replace that. So um, the humidity might mean that you're sweating more and you might need to uh, replace more of those electrolytes. Wind and cold mask that sweat factor. So again, am I sweating out a lot, even though I don't feel like my clothes are wet, like if you went and exercised in Florida or something, again, lick your hand. I know that sounds weird, but if it's salty, you need to replace. And cold climates and altitude can increase our need for calories. So if you think about it, if you're skiing and it's negative five degrees, your body is working really hard to keep itself warm. And then on top of it, you have your exercise. Underfueling, we talked about this the whole last presentation, but if you are overtraining and underfueling, you're gonna have chronic fatigue. You're just gonna be tired all the time. And you all have to worry about also how you're performing in school. Um, you might become anemic, so your iron is low. You might have GI problems, so you have tummy troubles, your stomach is bloated or pain or any of that stuff, diarrhea, constipation, um, cold intolerances. So if you are not fueling yourself a lot, you may um, be, too cold all the time. You don't have enough body fat to keep yourself warm. Um, the absence of the menstrual cycle, we talked about that um, last presentation. Stress fractures, that is a sure sign. And again, those things right there, we have the female athlete triad. Um, delayed injury healing. So if you feel like you're just not 
um, you're all young, so you should recover pretty well from exercise. And if you're not, and you're getting little injuries all the time, or you're feeling sore, you're not performing, it's probably because you're not eating enough. Um, and decreased performance. So that matters to all of you. Mood swings. So if you're feeling moody and um, maybe you can't concentrate at school, also might mean that you're, you're under fueling. And um, if you're always sick, again, lack of protein, lack of calories, decrease our immunity. And so if you're putting all of these things together, you'll be a well-nourished athlete and a well-nourished athlete performs well and is happy. And we want to be happy. Sports need to be fun as well as the competitive side of it. So if you're well-nourished, I always say you need to nourish to flourish. All right, that is it for me. We can take some questions. Well, thank you, Kara, for another excellent presentation here tonight. You know, I think ending on that note is great because I think there's so many things about sport that are uh, win-wins, right? They're um, so important for performance in our sports, but then they cross over and benefit so much in the rest of our lives as well. And nutrition is certainly one of those, right? So thank you so much. Um, really appreciate that. Should we open it up for some questions? I said we could um, use the chat and if folks want to raise uh, raise their hands, use that function, I can uh, unmute you uh, to be able to, uh, to ask questions yourself. So um, feel free to, to get started there. All right, we have a question in the chat um, from Kira Dyer. Is there anything you find that is very female specific that athletes should be aware of? Yes. So, um, you know what, that's broad spectrum again, but I do feel as if, and I think we touched on that just a little bit in the last presentation on the relative energy deficiency syndrome, Women um, and girls have a tendency to fall into that category more. We tend to need a little bit more fueling just because of the way that our body is. We do not operate on a low body fat percentage as well as men do. We, have, we are very, very different animals, women and men. So um, we do need to make sure that we're constantly um, refueling ourselves. I also wanna say that, especially when we're talking about young girls, um, and this can go, you know, into like young college age. They are more susceptible to injuries and um, the ill effects of overtraining and underfueling than some of the guys that can get rid of, that they, they can kind of do some of that. I also would say that I think that male athletes, let's say middle school, high school age, sometimes can handle a volume that's a little bit higher. Um, just because of physiology and sometimes the girls can. Doesn't mean that the girls aren't amazing and awesome. Just means that we have to fuel a little bit differently. I don't know if that answered your question, Kira. And then certainly older athlete, female athletes, there's a whole, whole slew of things we have to do different. Great, thanks Kara. Another question from Victoria Slavoni. Uh, my daughter was listening for a while. She said, but I hate breakfast and eating in the morning. What do you say to her? Well, what I would say is that it's, it is one of the most important meals of the day, as you've always been told, but it sets the foundation for everything. So if you think about it, just like I said, when we go to bed, you know, what time do we eat dinner? Five o'clock, six, seven, eight o'clock at night, you're eating, and then you are in a fasted state the whole entire night. So you're already at a deficit when you wake up in the morning. So what I would say is for proper um, concentration at school, I don't know how old she is. I think you, um, I think she's kind of young, if I remember your name from the last, um, the last presentation. But for them to have enough energy at school and then to go to training, breakfast is pretty crucial. And I do think, oh, the older one is 10 and a half, right, okay. so. Um, it is crucial and we can train our bodies to like different things. So if you just start maybe with some breakfast, that's a little bit smaller. You don't have to try to get her to eat as much as I was talking about, but we can train our bodies to then start craving that and, and enjoying that. So I think I would, I would probably start smaller and just see if she sort of um, grows into it. 
Thanks, Carol. Uh, another question from Gardner. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Gardner, want me to read? Yeah. So six Gardner Flanagan. Morning. Yeah, what do you recommend for athletes who have training at 6.30 in the morning? So, you know what? Um, <clears throat> it depends. It's always that dilemma of what do we do? We're going to spin class or skinning in the morning or you guys are going to training at 6.30. You still need to get something in. So there are a few things that you could do that could make it easy for yourself. I would say trying to get some food in. Uh, some athletes can get up and eat a full meal at six o'clock and in the morning and they feel great. It might be that <clears throat> I would imagine any training that's 6.30 in the morning is not going to be at your highest, craziest intensity, right? So I think that they would have leeway to eat some things that maybe the intensity wouldn't be quite a bit, um, isn't going to be that bad on their GI system, but getting a banana in there, even getting a smoothie in there, something you could prepare the night before, um, eating a couple pieces of toast, something. So they have some car carbohydrates gardener, and then afterwards they can kind of have their second breakfast and get their protein in there. Does that help? Great. We just had a question about uh, someone who jumped on late. If we'll be recording the session, we will be, and we'll put that on our website. And I'll send it out to everyone who registered as well, exactly where that will be. Uh, so you can find that as soon as you want. I'll post that on our website, and I can send it out to everyone who registered by email too. Um, Kara, I had a quick question. I know that cramping can be uh, really debilitating for some athletes, whether in competition or just through their training. And I think there's some new research on that. You mentioned hydration is key. Is there anything else from a nutritional standpoint that can help athletes who are really struggling with um, persistent cramping? You know, I can tell you also, it does seem to be more of an issue in males. So whether that is because you have higher needs for electrolytes and things like that, or if it's because they're not fueling properly, I have my thoughts on both of those things. I think it might be a little bit of both, um, but... Yes, I mean, if you are also making sure that you have all of those nutrients in each meal, you have some protein and you have some carbohydrates and you have some fat, then you're gonna be set up a little bit better to, to not cramp as much, but also not getting dehydrated. So most people are cramping when they are dehydrated. And also there are people who don't necessarily know they're getting dehydrated because they're not sweating that much. So I can tell you personally, I'm not somebody who sweats a lot, but the sweat is salty. So learning that kind of just takes a little bit of time. You know, there are people who they, they exercise, they run, they are Nordic skiing and they're soaking wet. Those people kind of know that they need to replace a lot of things. Um, and, and we can get a little bit more specific on some stuff. I don't know how in depth, you know, on that, but replacing things as you're going most definitely is going to help that. And um, I would say for your, for your average athlete, you're probably not going to need to do that, but certainly some of you that are doing three hour runs and things like that in the summertime, which I know some of the Nordic team are doing things like that, then you do need to re be replacing quite a bit per hour. I don't know if that answers your question. It does, it does, great, yeah. Any other questions out there through the chat or directly? Well, maybe someone's typing one right now, Kara. I had another one, uh, if I can do that. You know, what are the common mistakes that you see for athletes um, who are starting to make um, their own nutrition choices um, at this age? Uh, it is typically eating the wrong things at the wrong time and or not eating enough. So what I mean by that is going to training in the morning, let's say, um, after eating a big giant plate of bacon and eggs. <laughs> so it, when you don't know exactly what you might need, 
that's not going to, A, we know it doesn't have carbohydrates in it, so that's not going to give us enough fuel, but certainly you might not feel very good in your stomach if your coach is telling you to go run or do sprints on your Nordic skis or whatever you're doing when that's all you've eaten, right? And then also not eating enough. A lot of the um, mistakes I see are a lot of the athletes, and I remember this from being a coach, and now my son is in Winter Sports Club and I have to be on him for that, going to those practices in the afternoons and the evenings, especially at three, four o'clock time frame when they've been at school all day, not eating, not having a plan and not having something with you um, that you're going to eat maybe while you're in the car driving over, you're walking over, you're riding your bike over, or your parents are picking you up, not having a plan to have food before that training. That is way too long to go. I, most kids are eating lunch really, really early. So it is often, and then just going and grabbing things and sports products that you haven't used before. And then um, I've worked with a lot of athletes that in competition, in an event, they try something new and it goes haywire because it doesn't make them feel well. Or maybe it, it has a lot of caffeine in it and they're not used to doing caffeine, any of that. So trying everything out, um, but everybody's a little bit different. So it is trial and error. But the things that I see are not eating enough or just not eating the right foods um, or really not eating afterwards. That's a, that's a huge thing. You know, going four or five hours after um, training without having any food and you're not, you're just not optimizing what you can do with your muscles when you do that. Great, seen that. Anybody else, any questions out there? Okay, is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, I think that, um, you know, I added a few things into this based upon some questions I got actually after the last talk. So we always have room to build on this and talk about some other subjects based upon what people um, have. But what I would say is with your athletes, you know, we're talking to a very broad audience here, um, getting to know exactly what they need and becoming really serious about it as they move up um, in age and in their competition level, it is an absolute, um, vital part of training. And it's a vital part of our lives, right? To make us feel good anyway. So I feel that athletes in high school and uh, younger that get this information are set up so well for the rest of their lives. They're learning things that other um, kids might not be learning. So you can take this into everyday, everyday life. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Kara, once again, a huge thank you. And I'd also like to, just to send a huge thank you out to Mary Beth Strokeback and uh, UC Health. UC Health is a, is a gold level partner, uh, sponsor of the club. And uh, Mary Beth has been uh, tremendously helpful in helping us put together um, these presentations from these outstanding um, uh, medical providers, um, Kara included. So thank you so much. And uh, Kara, and thank you UC Health for putting these together. Um, as I said, I will post this on our website if Kara is okay with that, at least. Sure. And um, and also send this uh, email, uh, send a link out in an email to everyone who's registered too. So, Kara, thank you. Have, have a good night. Yeah. Great. All right. Great. Have a great night. Thank you, Kara. Thank you, Mary Beth. Bye.